Welcome to In Focus with Ijaz Heather. Putting out disinformation, unfortunately, has become a staple of most Indian media, barring some honorable exceptions. The space is fast shrinking for such publications and journalists to retain the integrity to speak truth to Mr. Narendra Modi's right-wing RSS government. While a disengagement process has begun in the Pangong So area in Ladakh, more on that later, Indian media have begun to put out stories that China is fast-tracking upgrades on J-20, which is a stealth fighter. Predictably, this is referenced in relation to India's acquisition of 36 Rafale fighters. India will get 17 of them by March this year. April 2022 is when it will have all 36 of them. The slant here should be obvious to any aviation enthusiast. One, China's development of J-20 goes back to the late 90s with what was then known as the JXX program. In 2008, the People's Liberation Army Air Force endorsed Chengdu Aerospace Corporation's proposal, which was termed Project 718. Since then, its design and other specs have gone through many changes and upgrades. It made its maiden flight in 2011, and the first J-20 combat unit was formed in February 2018. China has been planning to upgrade the engine from WS-10 to WS-15 much before the standoff in Ladakh began. Secondly, while Rafale is a 4.5 Gen fighter jet with impressive specs, including some of the air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles it carries, it has not seen combat against any formidable air force. France has operated it in Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria. Also, for it to become the mainstay of Indian Air Force, the IAF will have to have it in much greater numbers than the current assortment of 36. Currently, IAF's mainstay remains the Su-30 MKI. Indian media has also been casting doubts on J-20's capabilities, referring to it as a 3.5 Gen fighter. But let's get to our panel to discuss how the two fighter jets compare how real engagements happen in today's world, how plans are made and training conducted according to those plans, before we get to the broader issue of disengagement in Ladakh. I'm joined by Air Marshal Masood Akhta, a former fighter pilot and commandant of Air War College, Air Vice Marshal Ikramullah Bhatti, also a former, former fighter pilot, and Mr. Aina Tangan, a political and economic affairs commentator, who joins me from Beijing. Yeah, Marshal Akhtar, uh, as I said, uh, there are a number of issues that need to be uh, discussed. Uh, Rafale, as I said, is an impressive uh, omni-role uh, fighter. Uh, some of its uh, uh, weapons uh, that it's been cleared to, uh, to operate include the Mika air-to-air, -air, which is both BVR as well as within visual range, the Meteor, the Hammer, uh, and the Scalp. Uh, so give me a sense of, is this bluster by the Indians? Is this for internal consumption? Uh, how would you compare the Rafale with the J-20? And what is the situation with the upgrades of J-20? Rafale is uh, something to contend with. Uh, what you said is true. The weapons it carries uh, are impressive. Uh, the best, of course, is number one, the Meteor, and number two is the is the Scalp or or, or some the, the, the Scalp weapon. Uh, scalp has an impressive uh, air to surface range of roughly 300 plus kilometers uh, range for surface uh, areas. The Meteor is 100 plus kilometers in terms of beyond visual range. The rest, of course, Mika is an old one. Uh, the radar is very impressive. It is uh, uh, active electronically uh, scanned array radar, which is uh, quite a few transmitters that keep transmitting and keep receiving individual targets, which so can track many, many, many uh, targets simultaneously. So it is impressive. But when we compare it with the, with the, with the J-20, uh, actually, uh, it has got a the J20 has got a very impressive PL15, which is uh, in excess of definitely 100 kilometers, uh, which is better than uh, AMRAAM, which is better than Meteor. So it's a longer stick, and uh, so uh, in terms of BVR engagements or air superiority engagements, J20 will do better. Uh, 
Uh, at the same time, it has got uh, the AISA radar, which is similar, but mind you, the Chinese technology may not be very impressive as of now, but they are progressing and progressing fast. But what is to be noted is that the J-20 is stealth. It has got an internal weapon bay, and it carries both the short-range and the long-range missiles. So in terms of air combat, which is its basic role, air superiority, it is expected to do much better, if not then better than the Rafale. And uh, it does not have, as of now, air to surface capability, but of course they will evolve it and probably they will, they will have it in the future. So, but more important than anything else is the integration of weapons and the data fusion. Chinese have their own industry, they have their own development programs. So Meteor is likely to do a lot of good uh, to the Indian Air Force, which is a professional one, and uh, we must give them the credit. But in terms of technology, the Rafale is a little inferior right now to the J-20 because it is stealth. Uh, it carries internal uh, weapons and uh, it's got a longer stick in terms of beyond visual range engagements. So in any future or right now, the conflicts that, that can take place, uh, I think the J-20 will certainly do better in especially air superiority roles. And once the air superiority is achieved, then I think there are other surface air to surface weapons that are available with the with the Chinese that, that can take over. Right. That sets the ground for the discussion. Um, I'm happy you talked about PL-15 because PL-15 even got the, the U.S. Air Force worried. However, there are two things, and let me uh, take this to uh, ABM Ikramullah Bhatti. One is that um, PL-15 does not have a ramjet engine, uh, and the Meteor has that. And secondly, uh, you know, the Indian media was relying on certain analyses put out by former IAF officers, including Air Marshal R. Nambiar, uh, who even cast doubts at the stealth capabilities of uh, J-20 and also said that uh, one of the points that he was trying to make was that if J-20 was as good as the Chinese say it is, then why did China have to go for Su-35? Uh, which, of course, one can counter by saying, well, you know, Su-35 is an interim arrangement until J-20 fully comes online. Uh, but give me a sense of, uh, Avian Bhatti, give me a sense of how you compare the two. Well, th thank you for having me on the program. Uh, now, you see, when you compare the two aircraft, uh, we must keep in mind that uh, the maiden flight of uh, Rafal took place in 1985, whereas uh, for the J-20, it was 2010-2011. So uh, there's a 25 years of age difference between the two aircraft in terms of vintage. And as uh, we just heard, uh, uh, the uh, weapons on board the J-20, first of all, the, the PL-15, while it may not have a ramjet, uh, it, it certainly has much longer range. And right now, I read somewhere that uh, J-20 is being termed as a, a sniper in the air uh, because it's going to be uh, hidden, it's going to be shooting from a very long range and uh, shooting weapons which are very accurate. And while PL-15 may not have uh, a ramjet today, but uh, the Chinese are already working on a version which will have the ramjets, and they already have PL-21, about, uh, which we, we hear about. So uh, uh, J-20 is right now, I think, uh, is, is un undergoing tremendous upgrades. The engine is going to be different. The, the missiles are going to be different. Uh, and I, I'm sure uh, 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 more air-to-surface weapons will be added on, so which will add to the overall capability of the aircraft. And uh, while we can question that uh, uh, it, it may not be fully stealth, but then the, even the Americans accept this as the third uh, stealthy fighter aircraft to be produced in the world after the F-22 and the F-35. So if the Americans are acknowledging it, I think uh, uh, it will be inappropriate uh, to uh, question uh, the stealth capability of this aircraft. While they, they are also claiming that uh, some of the Indian fighters have uh, spotted uh, the GF-17, uh, the, the J-20 on the radars, uh, and they have detected it, so it's not fully stealthy. 
But the fact is that uh, during peace time, when the stealth aircraft fly, they invariably carry certain radar reflectors uh, for safety reasons, so that uh, the, the aircraft remain visible for airspace management. So I, I think uh, the, the, uh, it will be inappropriate to have any doubts on the stealthy capability of uh, uh, of this J-20 uh, uh, aircraft. And I, I think uh, as we go further, because even uh, uh, the, the, the Indians are going to have the full strength of uh, uh, the fleet uh, in, in, in two years' time, and if they want to go increase and uh, the strength further, it will take another couple of years. Also, they'll, they'll need another uh, two, three years to fully operationalize this aircraft and uh, uh, master its full capabilities. So, and uh, we also see that the Chinese are already uh, uh, upgrading the, the aircraft and they, they're not doing it, I think, to compete with the Rafale. They, they, they're in competition with the U.S. for uh, eventually aiming to be uh, reaching a position where they can uh, challenge the uh, American dominance of the world. Uh, not by the, their economy alone, but by their military prowess also. So I, I think uh, uh, it will be incorrect to compare the upgrade of the J-20 to match uh, uh, the Rafale. But in fact, they're looking at competing with the F-22 or the F-35 or any other next fighter or the weapon system that the Americans can come up with uh, in the next couple of years. So right. I think... Uh, uh, as already covered, uh, the uh, J-20 already has some significant uh, capabilities which uh, exceed uh, the capabilities of uh, Rafale. And uh, th there is uh, still work going on. And uh, in, in, in the years to come, J-20 will become even better, both in terms of its performance and in terms of weapons that it is going to carry. So on the whole, I think uh, in, in the coming years, when the Indians are able to operationalize their uh, uh, Rafale capability, J-20 would be much more capable and I think in a position to compete uh, this Indian aircraft in a much more effective manner. Yeah. Right, you, you made some very interesting points, especially I'm struck by the one that you talked about in terms of uh, uh, peacetime flying for safety reasons uh, and also the fact that you know you we, were talking about uh, you know comparison with the Raptor, the F-35 rather than the Rafale, uh, and and I'm I'm going to come back uh, with some other questions with reference to how we look at aerial combat in in this modern world where you know we the the idea is essentially beyond visual range, but let me get to uh, Mr. Ayana Tangen here, uh, Mr. Tangen. Um, uh, at a sort of broader scale, uh, as I said, <laughs> you know, disinformation is now unfortunately becoming a staple of how uh, the majority of the Indian media operate. Uh, I, I also talked about the disengagement from a uh, Pangong So. So uh, give us a sense of what the playbook here is really. Well, uh, quite frankly, I mean, th this is just a distraction. I mean, Modi is under tremendous uh, pressure at home with the uh, uh, the protests by the farmers. He's been accused of giving up land in, in and in, along the LAC um, by Rahul Gandhi. <clears throat> so at this point, uh, I think they're just trying to spin a narrative that China is somehow afraid of India, and that that's why they have the upper hand, and that's why they're not giving in. So I, I really wouldn't give this a lot of credence. Uh, they have 11 aircraft in hand. They don't have the experienced pilots uh, to operate them. This is just uh, a lot of noise in order to make political points. Right. Uh, also, uh, there was a sense of, uh, you know, the fact that China's economy, despite the initial uh, COVID-19 hit, uh, is, is bouncing back. Some sectors have bounced back. And of course, J20 and, uh, you know, there are now indigenous technologies, engines, whereas India is uh, reliant on um, imports from other countries. And 36 Rafales by April 2022, uh, it's not even going to be the mainstay of the Indian Air Force. So, but, but, but the idea, is, and I take your point, uh, the idea uh, is that this is about building a narrative. And, and selling it and marketing it. And frankly, I will give a lot of credit to the Indians. I mean, they've done this against Pakistan quite successfully. 
uh, and uh, you know uh, created a softer image of uh, democracy which is secular and inclusive uh, far from it uh, frankly but but that's that's what the narrative with the west is so perhaps that's something that needs to be uh, tackled uh, by beijing well I, i don't think that beijing is interested in countering all the um, political moves that are being made in and in, in in india um quite frankly they would like to just see more stability in the area they'd like to see india back off from this idea that they're going to be a, basically a a doorstop to uh china uh in the future uh they'd really like to see a, a united asia or at least an asia that is at peace with each other it is uh, from beijing's point of view it's hard to fathom what the end game is uh, that modi has in mind uh, the us as australia has just witnessed is not in a position to lend any aid or do any investment uh, abroad uh, they're going to be concentrating at home and uh, what's best quote for the american people not the world so this idea that uh, india will benefit from um, uh, the us uh, arrangement um, by you know in essence being part of this quad and and uh, opposing china just doesn't seem to make sense uh, india has uh, tremendous economic uh, challenges uh, now and ahead and it would seem to make sense to at least even if you don't want to be friendly at least try to explore how you can get more investment uh, by a country who's actually able to do it uh, right i mean we've discussed this a number of times on this program and uh yourself included and other chinese experts uh who uh you know appear on the program constantly been uh stressing the point about geoeconomics uh, about connectivity um but but what we see on the ground is also something uh, that has to be taken into account now give me a sense of despite beijing's uh you know uh, stressing the idea of connectivity and a cooperative framework if this goes south uh would beijing uh still remain sort of you know uh, in that mode of trying to have some kind of cooperative framework or beijing would kind of go for what it did in back in 1962 No, I, I don't think uh, China is interested in any kind of warfare. There's, there's no end game to it. Um, humiliating India again is just going to lead to more confrontations in the future. Um, you know, the, the Chinese uh, believe that their air force is superior. They don't care about the range and all of the issues that are associated. Their air force is more than twice the size of India's. Uh, they have, you know, that was just pointed out. these are indigenous aircraft to to china they have all the munitions everything that they need in order to do that uh india is stretched out they need parts and things from russia from uh also from uh, france uh it's just hard to see how this they could actually wage a protracted war they could fly a few sorties but they'd be running low on ammunition and i don't know that france would be in a, a situation or russia for that matter where they want to be supplying active munitions to India in a fight with China uh, it's not in their interest so i mean there's there's no real worry about the military side of this the concern is that you know india deteriorates becomes an issue uh, as you know asia rises and uh, that that could be a very destabilizing uh, there has to be a, some sort of plan i mean India is going to be the largest country in the world uh, by population and that is going to cause stresses and fractures so at this point all that china wants is for india to do well even if it does not want to do so with china so a very in points and frankly you know uh, one looks at uh, the regional economic comprehensive partnership <laughs> and uh, the irony is that it ultimately got pushed through and signed after india left uh, asep but uh, thank you so much uh, mr ayana tangan as always for your insights uh, let me uh, go back to a uh, marshal masood akhtar here a uh, marshal akhtar i was saying give us a sense of how modern aerial combat 
or the, the, the missions and training of uh, you know, formidable air forces are different from, let's say, 30 years ago or 40 years ago? Very different, very different. When myself and uh, Air Marshal Bhatti were flight lieutenants and squad leaders, uh, we thought of air combat only in the turning plan plane and we thought any aeroplane that can outturn another one will have the, have, have the better of the adversary. Not, not true today. Uh, and a portent and omen was shown during the 27th February clash uh, in 2019 when uh, these two uh, perky, uh, one wing commander, one squad leader, they locked up their Indian targets and uh, beyond visual range, at the range was almost, almost 50, 60, 70, 100 kilometers and uh, shot them out of the sky. So today, what counts is, number one, uh, the ranges of the BBR air-to-air -air missiles. What counts is the ranges, the, the standoff ranges of the air-to-surface weapons. What counts is uh, how well fused are the avionics of uh, these fighters. What counts is how well Overall integration takes place between the weapons and the and the avionics, uh, the radars. Like it was mentioned uh, by the air marshal that uh, the uh, PL-15 may not have a ramjet, but it still is. And we are talking of open literature. Is uh, uh, a Mark IV missile? A Meteor also is a Mark IV missile. Uh, but what our Chinese friend also said and what uh, my, my friend also uh, told, the J-20 is, is indigenous, the PL-15 is indigenous, their uh, AISA radar is indigenous, and they are progressing at a very fast rate. This is number one. So standoff ranges is what comes today and the kind of avionics and the way they mesh them together. Number two, in case of India and China, mind you, uh, one factor is very prominent. In, a, in an Indo-Pak conflict, America that is leading the globalized world and says there can be no destabilization anywhere because they want they're, they're, they, they want a bigger buck for their, for their dollar, for, for their money. So they can dictate to India and Pakistan that, okay, you will not fight a war, number one, you will not fight at all, number two, if you start one, you will finish it in 48, 72 hours. So India and Pakistan, but India in particular, cannot generate its total combat power with its large air force, notwithstanding our Chinese friends said, the in Chinese air force is bigger than maybe twice the size. So India will not be able to leave alone against China it will not be able to generate its true combat power even against Pakistan. If you recall Parkaram, the, the uh, parliament attack, the Indians almost were poised to strike Pakistan and that is when the travel advisory was sent to India the, and, and the Americans started to exit from Bangalore and uh, the other Europeans also followed suit. So India said, stop, stop, stop. We are not going to go, go to war. In the next one, General Widge, this was after, I think, after the Bombay attack, who came close to the border. And the Americans came to Pakistan and they said, we know that there is this armor formation close to the border. We have told them, so General Widge was removed, though he later made the army chief. So India, number two, cannot generate its total combat power that it is, it is, it is picking up. Against China, it is going to have a huge problem. But you, when you raise the issue of air combat, it has changed in style today. No longer Cobra maneuvers are going to be very important. No longer turning battles are going to be very important. More important, the tactics that our young fighter pilots today adopt in terms of grinding patrols in the, the kind of uh, circles that they make uh, at almost 100, 150 kilometers ranges and uh, then are able to integrate, are able to read all that information and uh, be able to connect the BBR missiles, or for that matter, the air-to-surface missiles, which happened on 27th February. So the character has totally changed by itself. Right. Very informative. Uh, now let's, uh, uh, you know, take this forward uh, and bring in uh, AVM Ikramullah Bhatti. Uh, AVM Bhatti, uh, Marshal uh, Akhtar is talking about the avionics, the beyond visual range. Um, we have also seen, and since he has referred to um, Operation Swift Retort, we've also seen 
the absolute uh, imperative of uh, coordination, uh, data link integration between the ground stations, the radars, the, the, you know, the strike package that is going, and then the domination uh, comms domination, which is essentially electronic in, in the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, and, and you know, these are also very important for what we call the, the seed, the, 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 you know, uh, seed operations. Uh, so give us a sense of how important, in addition to the kind of aircraft that an Air Force has, how important is training along these lines and developing these uh, measures and countermeasures and counter countermeasures. Our viewers would remember uh, a legendary fighter pilot Chuck Yeager. He uh, categorically said that uh, you can fly any any aircraft, uh, superior or inferior, with any amount of weapons and capabilities, but the the dominant aspect of, of any outcome would be how experienced are the air crew using that weapon. So, which which makes training very important how you utilize your weapon systems, or how well you utilize your weapon system to achieve the aim that you have set out for yourself. You see, in my uh, Air Force days, uh, almost 45 years ago, when I started to train in air combat, there used to be a, a very popular training slogan, lose sight, lose fight, which meant was that you could never lose the sight of the enemy. But today, comparing the two scenarios uh, of uh, mid 70s to uh, uh, mid 20s uh, 2020s i think uh, uh, the uh, the war or the battle or the conflict is over uh, beyond visual range and as i just mentioned uh, a little while ago the j20 is an airborne sniper so uh, without even knowing without even seeing uh, an aircraft gets uh, detected logged tracked and fired upon and is destroyed uh, without uh, the uh, firing aircraft ever uh, coming into the visual range. So uh, now we find that the, the training environment or the combat environment is so uh, complicated, it's so demanding, and there are so many factors uh, which, which govern this. Uh, it, it, uh, when, when you want to achieve uh, air dominance, you have to dominate the electromagnetic spectrum. You have to dominate the communication. You have to dominate the data link. You have to dominate the radar spectrums. So uh, when, when we look at uh, what happened on, on the 26th of February, two, uh, almost two years ago, uh, Pakistan Air Force was able to uh, control all these uh, areas. And uh, this is the new dimension air in, in air combat, because today the aircraft does not fight alone. I mean, it is supported by ground-based radar, it is supported by airborne radar, it is supported by other uh, sensors in the air, uh, be it his own friendly fighters or the AWACS. And all that data is being uh, shared, and the, the, there is some decision that is taking place automatically. There's some decision that the pilot himself is making, but there is a, a lot of support that the pilot has in, in terms of inputs and in terms of decision making. So he's able to take decisions which are the best, and he's able to utilize his weapons uh, to their optimum at the uh, longest distance away from the uh, target. So he, uh, while staying safe, uh, uh, from the enemy fire, he is able to launch his weapons and uh, achieve a kill. This was not the case a uh, couple of decades ago. And uh, that is how we find that uh, the uh, technology in military aviation has developed and advanced so much that today, whereas we say that uh, the workload of a pilot has reduced, but at the same time, because of the capabilities of the system that he has, his workload has even increased. So, and uh, the outcome of the battle is now... Uh, even more challenging because we find that even the adversaries have similar capabilities, and now uh, training will become more important as to how well you can utilize uh, your capability of the aircraft vis-a-vis uh, -vis those of the enemies, and that can only happen if you know how your enemy fares and you know how well you are trained, how uh, what are uh, your systems have the capabilities of, and you can match the two and achieve the result that you have set out uh, yourself for. So I, I think. Training will continue to uh, uh, remain dominant, as I just said, that Chuck Eager said. And uh, when we come to uh, the scenario of China and India, where we want to compare J uh, J20 with the Rafale, uh, 
China has made J20 itself. They have uh, flown it first time in 2011, and ever since they are developing it, they are developing it, training on it, and continuing to modify it and improve on it. Whereas the Indians have just acquired uh, the Rafale, and they are going to train, they are going to uh, so learn gonna, how to fly, how to take... operate, and it's... they will always remain behind the Chinese in this. And because the Chinese will always be ahead, they'll be far more experienced. They'll be able to utilize their weapon system much better. And whereas Chinese will, uh, the, the Indian will always be lagging behind. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. A very informative discussion. I'm really grateful to uh, Marshal Masood Akhtar and uh, Vice Marshal Ikramullah Bhatti. Uh, in addition to that, now emerging technologies, including the application of artificial intelligence uh, in combat. So uh, we are entering a territory uh, that is uh, rather unknown and uh, there's so many questions uh, to which we don't have the answers but thank you to both my panelists we shall take a short break and return to discuss how the space for free speech and dissent is shrinking in india stay with us Welcome back to In Focus. New Delhi police has arrested Disha Ravi, a leader of the Indian arm of Greta Thunberg's climate, climate crisis related Fridays for Future movement. Ravi, who is 22 years old, was brought for questioning to the Indian capital from a hometown of Bengaluru. The arrest has been widely condemned within and outside India. Thunberg had shared a toolkit on Twitter which listed ways to help Indian farmers who have been protesting agricultural reforms, their fear will ruin their livelihoods. A Delhi police official told reporters, and I'm quoting from what he said, the main aim of the toolkit was to create misinformation and disaffection against the lawfully enacted government. And he added, and this is again a quote, the toolkit sought to artificially amplify fake news through various tweets which they have created in the form of a tweet bank. And they sought the public to participate in the action on January 26. That was the Republic Day of India, unquote. Farmers have been protesting for months against three controversial farm laws. The government of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has used harsh tactics against the protesting farmers and also taken legal action against those supporting them. A farmer's protest has been noted by a number of celebrities outside India. But the real point to note is that this is happening in an environment where space for dissent is fast shrinking and where most media houses parrot the line taken by the government. To discuss this further, I'm joined by Yasa Luati, a French human rights and civil liberties activist, Patricia Reyes, who's a PhD candidate and researcher at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Twente in the Netherlands, and Imran Wali Ahmed, an Indian human rights and anti-corruption activist. Thank you to my panelists. Let me begin with Mr. Ahmed here. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, uh, I've got a list of uh, people. I mean, this list is kind of increasing almost every day of people who are behind bars, people against whom the Modi government has moved, uh, this, this includes uh, students, student leaders, rights activists, journalists. Um, I remember you were on my program earlier also, and we kind of discussed this uh, partially. Uh, how do you look at this? I mean, it, is this, this, this is the kind of slide uh, that's, you know, sometimes very difficult to arrest. Absolutely right, uh, Jaz, absolutely. Uh, it, it is uh, surprising for us because India has a history of, of activism. We have very powerful civil society organizations. We have always been at the forefront of making uh, our opinions known. We, we, we've always wanted change and we brought it about by protest on the street. That's how we've, we've been able to always pressure government to, to bring about change, to be so the people are part of any policy change. Uh, we have seen this happen in the past as well. However, in the last few years, it's uh, it's become much more rampant. As you mentioned, we've got some very powerful names lying in jail at the moment, many of them friends of mine, uh, really powerful people. This has gained a bit of global uh, sort of... Uh, um, um, 
yeah, uh, the, the global community has got involved now because there were global players that were attacked this time with uh, Greta Thunberg and of course Rihanna Street. But this has been going on for a while. The positive of this, if I can call it that, is that civil society is still not dead in India. They're still out there. They're still out there on the street. They're still trying to make a difference despite everything. They're out there making their voices heard. We can see what's happening with the farmers protests. Millions of people are out there on the street. In India, it is impossible to quieten us down. Whatever the government does, we will be on the street. We'll be there to make a difference. How many can be locked? You cannot lock millions and millions of people. There is still a majority of people that fight this. And again, I just want to make one thing clear. One of the big advantages of India is that even if the government specifically looks at either certain castes or religions or professions that they're trying to, to uh, attack, the other side, which is the activist side, does not look at these specifics. Their specifics are single, secular India. And that's how they come out on the street. So we are not going to stop. This is going to continue. And, I, and another thing, all these movements, these socio-religious movements that are now in the guise of political parties, they do not die automatically. They commit suicide. And this kind of action is only helping them to commit suicide. And finally, the victory will be ours. I mean, I, I'm optimistic for India because you cannot, even four years, five years, one person, two people, 20 people cannot change India. India is on the street. India will make a noise. And India will be the India of what we fought for. And that will not change. Right. Um, I am, of course, uh, going to return to you. Uh, I appreciate your optimism, but I have a couple of questions with reference to that. But uh, let me uh, pull in uh, Patricia Reyes here. Uh, Patricia Reyes, uh, you want to make an opening statement with reference to what's happening in India? Um, sure. I think that, um, fortunately, uh, this isn't the first time that uh, the Indian government has prosecuted activists or journalists uh, for their activities online. Uh, but I do think that uh, this uh, specific case can be singled out uh, because of it's being built around the narrative of international interference um, and a narrative of uh, uh, even like an, an international uh, conspiracy uh, to create this effect. Uh, of India as a country. Um, and I think this comes from uh, the, the collaboration that people outside of the India have uh, done to raise awareness to the Indian uh, protest. Um, I think it's important to put in context as well uh, the, the actions uh, from Disha Ravi and uh, Greta Thunberg as well. Um, and the context I talk about is their work uh, with the organization Fridays for Future. And um, this is um, because this is a movement that is trying to tackle climate change. Uh, young activists that are part of it, they uh, naturally see the, the need for uh, global cooperation and global collaboration. So it's quite uh, so it's quite normal for them uh, to look at political issues that are happening outside of their locality and uh, and support uh, activists that are having struggle um, in other parts of, of the world. So it's uh, um, for them, it's quite common, for instance, to um, to comment and even help organize actions uh, that are happening um, somewhere else. So I think that if we if we keep this in context, uh, we can uh, we can see uh, the, the um, this uh, creation of, of the so-called toolkit or Google document as, uh, you know, just like a, a, a common um, um, action or, or strategy uh, of uh, young climate activists like Disha and, and Greta Thunberg. Right. Um, Yasa uh, one of the things that's uh, fairly clear over the, the past two years, uh, if not the, the, you know, the previous five years of this in uh, right-wing government in India, is that it's extremely, A, it's right-wing, which is very clear. And secondly, its supporters rely on uh, slogans of nationalism. Uh, nationalism that's almost uh, xenophobic, almost jingoistic. And so dissent is branded as anti-national. Uh, and that creates a fair psychosis. Uh, give me your sense of how you look at these developments in India. 
you have to first, you know, keep in mind that the the person in power in India today, you know, Modi, is not unknown to the international opinion. We are talking about a person who was directly involved with the Gujarat massacres of 2002, and that who made a name for himself, not to serve India's interests, but to serve Hindu nationalism. And that in turn has led to the rise of a fascist government that everybody is watching and kind of in, in, in a dismay, because we, what happened to this activist in India, now, a toolkit has spurred a crackdown from the highest levels of the government, and that person was only standing against global warming and to protect lives in India. In return, we have this government feeling so paranoid, so scared of its own people, that they labeled her almost an enemy of the state and standing with an international conspiracy, as I said before me. And what we have to keep in mind at the same time is that before this government cracked down on the rest of the Indian population, it flexed its muscles and stretched, stretched them on the Muslim population through the citizenship uh, law of 2019. So we, when the person before me that I salute, by the way, from Paris, said that, yes, those movements commit suicide. Yes, but before they commit suicide, they bring everybody down with them. We saw what happened in Europe, for example, when fascism came to power. Yes, they committed suicide, but they were not alone, and the whole country was a drug to the abysses. And what we fear today for India is further violence, not only from the government towards the Indian farmers today, with whom we stand naturally, but for the division along, along you know, religious and ethnic lines. And we don't see how this Modi government will stop short of bringing his own country to the brink of a national suicide. Now, uh, uh, yes, uh, Luati, you're making a very important point, and I know that you also work in the area of Islamophobia. You mentioned Europe also, right-wing elements within various countries in Europe which threaten uh, the secular, inclusive uh, character of those countries. So, uh, and you also mentioned rightly uh, Mr. Narendra Modi's uh, you know, performance as the Gujarat chief minister. Uh, there was a pogrom of, uh, of Muslims in 2002 on his watch. So do you have a real fear that in addition to what's happening, I mean, this involves, uh, you know, uh, other Hindu, uh, uh, you know, uh, citizens also, but do you have a real fear with reference to the Muslims and other religious minorities under this uh, Modi government? I mean, uh, definitely, I mean, like we are... I mean, like, you know, seen from where we are, of course, we are far, we are in Europe and watching with, with some kind of distance, but that India would have at its head a notorious fascist was already towards a, a sign of, you know, of a shocking turn towards the far right. And we see that, unfortunately, where, you know, um, Modi appealed to the masses by saying, we are going to serve the, our interests as Indians first. He ended up dividing his own people, and there are fears for Muslims. How many Muslims got beaten in the streets? or executed by Hindu mobs in the streets. And we also have to mention and salute the work of the journalist Rana Ayub, who's been reporting almost on a daily basis over what was happening as the citizenship law was being passed. So really, like today, India is at a crossroads to how much it can so further support this nationalistic rhetoric. And yes, Muslims in India today are in a far worse position than they were, let's just say, five years ago, adding to it the scarcity of resources, the corruption of this government. I mean, like the Modi government just you know, got the award of the most corrupt regime in India. That's not something we can you know, dismiss. On top of that, this will come with further, you know, how can I say, singling out of minorities, because people will be put in a rival position. They will not be asked to stand together in the face of, you know, common challenges. So some minorities will be scapegoated, Muslims, Catholics, and even the Sikh, to, to just to name a few. And again, we cannot lecture Indians over what's best for them, but we know in Europe that one fascist is allowed to continue on this course, everybody is going to pay to, to end up paying the highest price. And the highest price may be, you know, you know, restlessness for India for decades to come. Right. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, uh, Yasser Luasi has, uh, has made a very important point with reference to the fact that, you know, even when these movements ultimately die, 
before that, they do a lot of damage, and uh, there's, of course, historical empirical evidence about that. I can also tell you, uh, with reference to my own experience, uh, I have a number of friends in India, uh, secular, intellectual friends. Uh, I used to get them on my program all the time. Uh, ever since uh, this government has arrived on the scene, and especially in the last year and a half, most of them, uh, some of them still have, uh, I would say, the, the courage to appear on my program, but most of them would privately tell, them, uh, tell me that, uh, you know, it's kind of difficult now. So uh, the fear psychosis that I was talking about is, is very real. And I'm talking about people, uh, I'm not talking about downtrodden people, I'm talking about people who are pretty uh, heavyweights in India. Yeah, yeah, there's no question about that. But you know, uh, you've used the word fascism, etc. And you know that the target is always the intellectual uh, class within a country. And that's, that's who they target. So yes, absolutely. You're right. But I do want to make one or two uh, statements uh, on, you know, sort of on what I've just heard. I, both of them absolutely right. Nothing wrong with what they said, absolutely. But one of the distinctions, uh, because uh, you know we're talking about Islamophobia as well, and we see uh, the Islamist movements, and we see as Muslims, we get very upset when when we're clubbed in with the Islamists. And I want to say exactly the same thing for the Hindu population in India. This is Hindutva. It's right. very different. It does not serve the Hindu purpose either. This is Hindutva. It it is a percentage of India. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 30, 35 percent, but it is not an overwhelming majority of India. And 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 uh, change has to come from within. Again, that was mentioned earlier as well. We have to bring about the change. And and it is movements like the farmers' movement that's going to bring about this change because there is no other way to do it. He has had, uh, as was mentioned earlier, he was banned from entering Europe and America, and yet they are the closest business partners of this man and have supported him right through the process uh, right through his, his prime ministership. So uh, we have to fight the battle because nobody is going to help us in it. Europe and America abdicated their responsibility on human rights when he became prime minister because he was a counter to China. He was a, 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 a possible uh, ticket to make more money. And so they, they were very happy doing business with him. He didn't change. He was exactly the same man. He won on that ticket of 2002. And he's only doing what he has promised to do. He has not changed anything. He has always been transparent in his hate. And yet governments have been able to do business with him. So again, we have to bring about the change from inside. And the way to do it is continuously, civil society has to be out there making as much noise as possible, irrespective of what happens, irrespective of whether they're locked up, which is horrible to see. As I said, many of my friends are locked up. Wonderful people, some charged, some not even charged yet. And, and on ridiculous charges. As for the foreign hand, you know, the, the thing that this was a foreign movement, we've heard this too for four years. Every time a movement begins in India, the, the farmers' movement, the entire movement is meant to be Khalistani, backed by Canada and backed by Europe and backed by all kinds of people. The easiest bogeyman is anyone outside. You Pakistanis, you're blamed for almost everything. I mean, you blamed us and we blamed you. We were perfect scapegoats for each other. So w India has used this, this foreign hand for well, even previous governments. But this government has been using the, the whole question of foreign involvement in bringing about uh, 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 terror and mayhem in India. They've been using it for a long time. This was, uh, as I said, this was a, a globally um, uh, reported and therefore this has become global news and I'm really glad that people have got up internationally now and making a noise because this is something you have to you have to talk about. We have a farmer's strike. Have you ever seen so many people for so long stand out there in the cold in the streets right. outside Delhi? There are millions and millions of people. And yet the reporting and the coverage was was hardly hardly touched by it was, but not as much as it should have been. This is one right. of the largest movements in the world. And peaceful. Right. Uh, I might refer to uh, you know, Pakistan with reference to foreign hand. I often wonder if there were no Pakistan, what would Mr. Modi do with reference to the foreign hand? But um, I've run out of time also. So before I wrap up, let me go back to Patricia Reyes. Yeah. Uh, Patricia Reyes, you've heard uh, Imran Wali Ahmed also and Yasser Luwati also. Any final thoughts? 
Um, um, sure. No, I think I agree with uh, with both of them. Um, and I do see uh, what Imran you said about um, there. I mean, I mean, we didn't see um, any uh, much coverage about the farmers' protest until there were these, um, you know, celebrities um, or uh, global figures uh, uh, tweeting about it or speaking about it. And I, I, I think that uh, what the Indian government uh, did uh, to Disha Ravi um, just uh, speaks plenty about uh, how um, successful uh, these these online actions were to. Uh, raise awareness on what was happening in in India and it's just a backlash and 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 um yeah with the intention to to silence um the people who are daring to speak out um yeah and so and so I I agree with Yasser as well if we see this happening in one country we should all you know like raise our hands and 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 make it stop because it it can just uh, uh, you know, grow and it might uh, and it might be our turn next. So, yeah, thank you Absolutely. for providing the space to talk about it. No, no, my thank you so much, Yasa Luathi, Patricia Reyes, and Imran Wali Ahmed for being with me uh, and uh, you know giving your insights on the situation in India, which frankly is fast deteriorating. In fact, we could talk about it at length i've got an hrw report in front of me which which reads like uh, you know uh, there's a litany of indictment of this government and how it's uh, trampling uh, a human and other rights anyway this is all from in focus tonight we shall see you tomorrow at the same time keep following our latest updates on social media at indus.news good night and goodbye <laughs>